Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the second plenary session of GYSS 2021. I am your moderator, Chan Hing Chi. I am delighted to introduce our speaker for this lecture, renowned Israeli Nobel laureate, Professor Aaron Chehanova. To an audience such as this, he needs no introduction. But let me remind you that he is a biochemist who, with his team, won a Nobel in chemistry for ubiquitination. He is a Technion Distinguished Research Professor at the Rappaport Faculty of Medicine and Research Institute. Now, Professor Chehanova will speak on the topic, topic of biomedical ethics, the corona pandemic and beyond. He's tweaked the title a little and it has become longer, but it's the same subject. He will lecture for approximately 35 minutes and take your question. As you listen to the lecture, you may wish to start sending in your questions to the chat. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Professor Chihanova. Thank you very much, Professor Chi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the listeners, wherever you are. It's a peculiar year. Uh, typically, we meet in Singapore, in beautiful Singapore. This year, we are scattered all over the world. But hopefully, with the vaccination, and Israel is really galloping ahead, we already vaccinated a quarter of the population. I myself got the two shots. Uh, we hope that uh, the virus... Uh, will phase out from our lives, but still leaving behind uh, the problems that we were living with uh, before it. Let it be cancer, let it be uh, famine, let it be climate change. There are still many problems on the table that needs to be solved once the virus will be defeated. So I picked up a subject that is a kind of, uh, I'm not sure how many people thought about it, when we think about the virus, we think about the biology of the virus, about the disease, about vaccination, but there are many other issues that we don't think, and these are bioethical issues. And this is just a small chapter in the issue of biomedicine at all as related um, to medicine. Since I am not only a biochemist, I am also a physician, this interface between science and medicine and the patient is extremely uh, interesting for me. And it has many cultural, uh, historical, uh, ethnographic uh, aspects. And I will try just uh, to highlight for you some of the bioethical issues that were raised along uh, the pandemics and then open it for questions. So let's go to the first slide. So what are the issues that were raised, the ethical issues that were raised uh, around the pandemic? There are five of them that we are going to discuss, the treatment priorities, neglected subjects, vaccination, the pandemic of information, the misinformation and the disinformation, and then the inequality and discrimination. If, if, in, if time will allow us, we shall uh, then go and expand it beyond the pandemic and go to medicine at large. So let's start with the treatment priorities. Uh, during the first lockdown that the, almost the entire world uh, um, went into, Israel now is in the third lockdown and hopefully the last one, people were concerned and in some countries it came to practice, uh, like in the maybe nowadays in the UK, but beforehand in Spain and in Italy, how to prioritize treatment. If you need to respirate, to put on ventilator, 100 people, and you have in the local hospital only 10 respirators or 50, how you decide who is going to be treated and who is not going to be treated? Are you going to uh, prioritize people by age? Are you going to prioritize people by having families, big families, small families? Are you going to prioritize them by having pre-morbid state, other diseases? Basically, what you are going to do is to decide who is going to live and who is going to die. And that's an unbelievably heavy ethical burden on the shoulders of those who have to make decisions. And if I go to the next slide, it became practical, the next slide. And let's go to North Italy. 
and you see that Italian doctors on the coronavirus frontline in Milan, in North Italy, face tough calls on whom to save. Israel also went into it. Luckily, we have never came to test the, the criteria that we set. The Israeli medical system is an excellent system, excellent public health. Singapore too, but you are not in Singapore, you are in different countries now. Um, and we never came to the point that we have to decide uh, whom to put on a ventilator or, or whom not. But nevertheless, getting ready to do it, we put a very complicated set of criteria that take into consideration mostly pre-morbid state, you know, like terminal cancer patients that have only a few weeks to live uh, and so on and so forth. And even that raised huge demonstration and huge protest how we discriminate sick people and, and, and doom them to die rather than giving them a chance to live. But, you know, when you are in short, you need to set criteria. We don't have not only the issue is not respirator so much. The issue is an issue of teams, of expert teams that have to do it. But nevertheless, Israel put, I would say, not ideal, but optimal set of criteria. So you see that this issue came, and in Italy it came, in Spain it came, in the UK it's coming up, people don't talk about it, but it's a big issue. Next one, next slide. The other issue is neglected subjects. You know, when all the hospitals are flooded with the, with the corona patients, what about cancer patients that need irradiation? What about cancer patients that need surgical resection of the tumor? What about handling climate change that is still on the table in in a big way so. What about uh, uh, you know, dissemination of malaria and AIDS in uh, African countries? You know, we put aside everything just in order to handle the disease. Is it justified? Isn't it justified? Again, how to balance the, the fact that the corona took our lives in a storm versus the usual life? What to do about it? Well, again, there, you know, each country, according to their, its health system, have to really decide. In Israel, there was a problem at the very beginning. I think that now, again, we came to a balance, but each country, the balance is uh, very different. But it's not only diseases. Think about the lockdown. Think about children that have to go to school and to the first class, to elementary school, and need to learn writing. And then they are sitting at home. And not in every country they can have Zoom, but even studying via Zoom is not an optimal condition. Think about a six years old child that needs to go and study how to read and write, and now he is locked down in his home uh, with his parents that are became all of a sudden unemployed because of the lockdown. And think about violence in the um, in the family. Think about uh, battered uh, women. Think about people that go unemployed and don't have uh, enough money to, to, to live. Think about uh, obesity, people that eat endlessly. Think about uh, crimes. Think about, uh, you know, dropping out from schools. I mean, all these uh, subjects that are neglected just in order to treat corona patients. So some of the problems are problems that have been with us before, but some of the problems have not been with us before and came up to the surface only because of the corona. Next slide. You see, we are talking about, you know, everybody sits in front of the television. This is kind of a cartoon, and the climate change is uh, threatening to bury us all, and it is going to bury us if we are not going to handle it, uh, you know, urgently. Next slide, please. And next slide. Now think about the pandemic of hunger. You know, people are hungry and all of a sudden uh, people are locked down and people are lacking food and so on and so forth and we are not dealing it. Think about AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis that are surging and it's all coming from the scientific literature. You know, I made sure that all the information that I present to you is not misinformation, is not disinformation. It's an information that is coming from the most uh, reliable and trustworthy scientific literature. So all those issues need to be taken place side by side with handling the corona. The next slide, please. And the next one. 
Now let's go to vaccination. And vaccination is really a problem. Uh, now we are beyond the scientific uh, breakthrough. We have vaccines and we have efficient vaccines. Let it be the, the messenger RNA-based vaccine of Pfizer and Moderna. Let it be the, the viral vector of AstraZeneca. Let it be the Chinese one. Let it be the Russian one. Some are, are tested more rigorously. Some have been tested less rigorously. But nevertheless, we have a solution. But then we have the people. And there is a big anti-vaccination movement, especially in the United States, but not only in the United States. And people are afraid, uh, probably wrongly so, but they are afraid and they don't want to take it. Let's go to the next slide and we'll go a little bit deeper into it. So you see the demonstrations in the United States. You know, the, anti, the left upper corner, the left anti-vaccine movement might uh, undermine pandemic efforts. It may fail us in defeating the, the, uh, the disease. In the middle picture, you see demonstrations say no vaccine. In the lower right side, you see trust God, not vaccines. And then in the upper, uh, 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 upper right corner, it says uh, uh, kill me before you vaccinate me. People are ready to die. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what we think about it as scientists. It matters that millions of people in the world are believing in it. So we need to convince them whether we, we think that they are stupid, whether we think anything about them, uh, that their claims have no foundation. We need to understand the foundation and the roots of this phenomenon and handle it intelligently. Let's go to the next slide. And you see the same story. Uh, this is a planned global power uh, grab. People think that it's a conspiracy. The messenger RNA vaccine, you know, the one that I took myself in order to protect myself and my environment, will kill millions more than, co than COVID-19. The vaccine, the treatment, the therapy will kill more people. You know, people are holding this science in their hands. Let's forget about the rest. So what are the roots of it? The roots are very dangerous. Let's go to the next slide. And in the next slide, the... You'll see some of the roots. Andrew Wakefield, you see covers of two books. Andrew Wakefield is, was, well, he still is, he's alive, an English physician, a pediatrician, gastroenterologist, a gastroenterologist that treat diseases of the, of the gastrointestinal tract in children, that published a book and made huge, you know, crowd following him about vaccination with a triple vaccine against uh, measles, uh, 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 rubella, uh, it's uh, measles, rubella, and, and smallpox, uh, I think, that, you know, that getting the triple vaccine leads to autism. Le basically, we'll take the vaccinated children and turn them in highly likelihood becoming autistic. Wow! that sends a shiver in the spines of mothers. And all of a sudden, they stop vaccinated the, 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 their children. The, the measles started to surge, and measles is a very dangerous disease. Many people died because of it. Now, you know, if a physician tells it and shows up in the BBC and in the English television and then all over the world, people believe it. You know, he's a doctor, after all. And people already had some doubts about vaccination. And then it took billions of dollars and numerous years in order to refute it. Not only that, but he published his paper also in a very reputable medical periodical in The Lancet, which is one of the two leading periodicals in the medical community beside the New England Journal of Medicine. And it took billions of dollars to do clinical trials in order to refute one by one all his claims, leaving nothing out of them. Let's look at the next slide. And the next slide just shows you titles that I took out of the literature, again, from the, from the reliable peer-reviewed literature, saying there is no link between vaccines and autism. 
Vaccines ingredients do not cause autism. Lack of association between measles, mumps, and rubella. Sorry, I forgot. It's the, the MMR, the triple vaccines against measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, vaccination and autism in children. Lack of association. Uh, MMR and autism. Further evidence against a causal a, a association. But in order to write such a paper, you need to carry out a trial and to follow the population of the vaccinated children to show that there is absolutely no link. It took years on years on years and billions and billions of dollars to refute a stupid claim by, I don't want to, to give any, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, comments on, on Andrew Wakefield. And still people don't believe because there is some mistrust even in the, in these people don't read these papers. Who read these papers? Only physicians and, and medical students, the medical community. And, but gradually it phased out. Then let's go to the next slide. So it shows you there is, a, um, again, then uh, the Lancet pulled out the paper and then other books came out. You see another book, The Doctor Who Fooled the World. Science, Deception, and the War on Vaccines. And then another paper in Nature, the discredited doctor hailed by the anti-vaccine movement. They love him, the anti-vaccine movement. So, uh, and here you see in the lower uh, photo, you see Andrew Wakefield in kind of a press conference surrounded by his admirers. So you see, we are fighting, you know, the scientific and the medical community is fighting uh, evil uh, winds that are blowing all over the place. Let's go to the next slide. And you see uh, another issue. Look at, the, at this one. When people were asking the United States about the corona, once there will be a vaccine, how many will take it? You'll see that there is a no. The no is the light, uh, um, the light pink. And, and you see, if you look at the biggest number, the biggest number is 40. It's the line before the lowest one, and it's in the black community. And as you know, the black community in the United States was the, 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 most, the hardest to be hit. Most of the corona patients, a lot of the corona patients also who died, came from the black community in proportion to other sections of the American population. So how is it that the community that is the, the, most, the, the hit most hardest uh, is the one that is the most disbelieving uh, in the... In the vaccination, but the numbers themselves are really frightening. Let's look at the other number. Also, the Hispanic. The second, no, no, go back. The second, uh, the second biggest uh, is the Hispanic and the young ones, the under age of sixty. And you see that the oldest one are the ones that believe the most because they are really at the highest risk. But let's just deal with the black one. Why is it? Well, it has to do with the. Uh, with the tradition of discrimination. The black people are discriminated in the United States for, for centuries, from the age of slavery, uh, from the pre-Lincoln era. And they don't trust the government. Uh, they, 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 the, the government is the one that discriminates them. But let's go and, 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 and go into it in a little bit more detail. Let's go to the next slide. This is an unbelievable story. In, the, in 1932, the American Health Authority started an unbelievably cruel experiment on a black society that was living in a village in a, in a small township in the United States called Taxigi. Taxigi. And the idea was to let people develop syphilis without treating them in order to study how the natural course of the disease evolves. But in order to treat the people, in order to follow the people, they had to lie them and to tell them that they are getting treatment, but basically they were not getting treatment. So they got injection of water, of saline, of nothing. So they thought that they are getting treatment, but they were not getting treatment. So about 450 black people were, that were diagnosed with syphilis told that they have uh, some disease, it's called bad blood. They are getting treatment for the bad blood 
And then the doctors follow them knowing that they are sick, knowing that they can be treated, but nevertheless did not treat them. This is the deepest betrayal of the medical um, I swear. You know, when I graduated medical school, I swore, I, I was reading a swear, an oath that the, my first loyalty always will be to the patient, not to the government, not to anybody else, not to the fund, not to the healthcare agency, not to anybody else, but to the to the patient. And this was a betrayal, a straight on attack on the oath that physicians are all should all abide by. The experiment was running from 32, you will not believe it, to 72. Many of the patients died. Some of them Now they are not alive anymore, maybe two or three. Um, and some of them uh, um, um, uh, survived all the 40 years. And only in 72, it was sought, stopped. It took 40 years. And later on, President uh, Clinton uh, apologized to the black community on the big mistake that was done by the medical authorities of the United States. Now you can imagine what happens. You know, for the for the for the black uh, community in the United States, the American government, represented in this case by the by the health authorities, uh, looked at them like they were rabbits, like they were experimental animals, not like a human being. You see a disease evolving in a human being, and you sit aside doing nothing. You know, there. Are, I don't need to go on with it. Just to explain you the number of 40% of the population that are objecting getting any vaccination from the government, anything from the government that has to do with their body. So, you know, I don't want to go in depth because we are very short in time and we have to finish in, in a few minutes. But just to give you an idea what's going on with vaccination and what are the roots or part of the roots of the anti-vaccination A, a movement, though everybody realizes now that this is the only way out of the pandemic. The only way out of the pandemic is to get vaccinated. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, then there are other issues with the vaccination that uh, don't have to do with the science. It has to do with equality. You know, rich countries can afford it, like the United States. Poor countries cannot afford it. Um, Israel luckily could afford it. We get uh, Israel is also very small. We are in, in a unique situation, and we can uh, we have a very sophisticated health fund. We can vaccinate the entire population within uh, less than two months. So we are very attractive to the to the to the pharma companies that make it because now they will have data from eight million people. You know the the rise of the antibody titer, the effect of the second shot on top of the first shot. And there is an agreement between the government of Israel and Pfizer and Moderna about sharing the data. So for them, it's the biggest field experiment ever done on human beings, of course, for the benefit of human beings. So we are in a, in, in a unique place, but the poor countries either don't have supply or need to buy vaccines that have not tested all the way down and so on and so forth. So you see that the issue of vaccination Um, is uh, complicated, and the fact that the company can make a vaccine doesn't mean that it will be available to every walking human being on the face of Earth. So let's go to the next one. And of course, vaccination priority. Even Israel has to prioritize. Luckily, now we are moving very fast. So we decided to go to the population in uh, in risk, which are people that are 60 years and older, initially with severe premorbid state, then all people above 60. Now we are moving down to 55. We are moving to teachers. We are moving to the military. And then at the end, we are going to the general population. And then later on, only once will be approved to children and pregnant uh, women or women that plan on a uh, pregnancy. So we also prioritize, but everything is condensed into an unbelievably short timeline and within two months we are going to immunize the entire nine million or eight and a half million population in, in, of the country but vaccination priority again is an issue in every country um, because the the vaccines vials the aliquots are coming in uh, 
in different shipments. And then uh, you need to, to know what to do with the first shipment, with the second, with the third, and so on and so forth. Let's go to the next one. So then the, we are going uh, um, to a different issue that has to do with vaccination, and I'll make it short. And that's what type of experiments to do. Uh, you know, when you, are, when you are designing a vaccine, the, the most naive experiment and the, and the morally, ethically one is, of course, uh, to vaccinate half of the population, to vaccinate, let's say, 10,000 people and to give placebo to another 10,000 people and then to see how many of them get this, the disease or not. And this is exactly how Moderna and Pfizer that are in AstraZeneca did, and that's how the data were published. So let's say that you give it to 10,000, and from the vaccinated people, uh, uh, 50 people got uh, the disease. And from the 10,000 that got placebo, 1,000 people got the disease. So you say, okay, it's 95% safe or 95% efficient. Sorry, not safe. This is one way to go. Uh, another way to go, which is scientifically more sound, well, even this experiment raises a lot of issues. Okay. Now you know that the vaccine is uh, efficient. What are you doing with those that got the placebo? Let's say that they are young people that got the placebo. Now you know that they got the placebo. Are you going to vaccinate them? Do you have enough? Are the companies and the state, the countries in which the experiment done, committed to vaccinate also those that they know that were not vaccinated? If they volunteer to the experiment, they did something for the society, but they are not going to enjoy anything, are you going to do something with them? This is one issue. Another issue is, of course, the issue of uh, the experiment is not well controlled because everybody gets a different disease. Some got severe disease, some got a milder disease, some got an asymptomatic disease. The best way, of course, is to infect the people, to give each of them million viruses, for example, and, and after they got immunized, and to see whether they are indeed vaccinated. But this is really a, a, a very a severe ethical issue. Uh, are we going uh, to really purposely infect people with the virus in order to set... Uh, and you see a whole set of, uh, again, titles. Look at the middle, upper one. Controversial human challenge. Are we going to challenge human beings for COVID-19 vac vaccine? And gradually it gains support um, and, and, and so on and so forth. And also to test the different vaccines against one another. The upper right corner taken from PNAS and other reputable periodical. Is it ethical to test promising corona vaccines against less promising ones? Because the less promising one people may refuse to get. Let's say that the AstraZeneca is only 60% efficient. And the Pfizer is 95. Will you go in? But the, but the AstraZeneca, it costs only $2 a dose, and the Pfizer costs $30 a dose. What you are going to do, how you are going to balance it. So, this is another bioethical issue. You see, so getting a vaccine in the laboratory of the company is only the beginning of the road, certainly not even, you know, the middle, not to say the end. Let's go quickly to the next one. Next slide. The next one is the infodemic. You know, the social networks did an unbelievable bad service to the whole issue. And I will bring you just two examples. Let's uh, go to the next slide. By, by spreading all kinds of stupidities that are unbelievable. And I'll take only two examples out of millions of them. First on the left side is the outgoing president of the United States. Uh, meanwhile, he did some other things, but this is not our issue. He promoted uh, all kinds of things. He promoted Clorox, a chlorine injection of chlorine uh, into the veins, uh, into people unheard of. But then he also promoted the drug called hydroxychloroquine. And uh, it, this is an anti-malarial drug. And he promoted it. He is not a physician. Uh, many uh, physicians opposed it. Even his uh, medical advisor, Tony Fauci, uh, opposed it. But nevertheless, he kept on 
because of whatever reason, I will not go to analyze it, um, he promoted hydroxychloroquine. Then a very detailed study by the WHO, by the World Health Co um, um, uh, Organization, a study, again, you know, a president of the United States, the biggest country in the world, well, not the biggest, the, the strongest or one of the strongest countries in the world, promote a drug that requires later on billions of dollars or millions of dollars in several months of an ex or trial on patients that will get a useless drug in order to refute it. There was no base to believe that it works even, but it was completely refuted. People should be more cautious, even presidents of countries. I think that the issue of the intervention of the politicians with the science was the most dangerous aspect of the pandemic. And then uh, the hero of uh, millions and millions of people, she has 50 million followers uh, in her Twitter and Facebook, Madonna. She, con she claimed that uh, COVID there is a COVID-19 conspiracy, that actually there is a vaccine. This was many months ago before there were vaccines, but, uh, but Bill Gates and other billionaires are keeping it for themselves, initially for the friends, and then in order to sell it for unbelievable price, in order to become even bigger billionaires than they are already. This was a nonsense, a complete nonsense. Why she did it, God knows. Again, I will not go into analysis. Many psychologists went into it. But there is an old saying in Hebrew that say a stone, one single stone that is being thrown into the lake by one stupid person, thousand wise men will not be able to pull it out. I think that this is correct for these two people and for many millions of other fake news disseminated during the pandemic. And let me go to the last one. In the last one, um, um, again, and uh, you know, the, because of the pandemic, the disease became a disease of distrust. And uh, again, science and policy collide during the pandemic. And now to tackle pandemic, Biden, the newly entering president of the United States, must overcome distrust and division. So you see how a scientific problem that could be solved relatively easily is becoming much more burdensome because of so many stones that are being thrown into the lake by so many um, um, people that should be mistrusted. I don't want to use much more stronger terms. Let's go to the next one. And the last one is the issue of inequality and discrimination. And it's also started, uh, you know, we are living in a very fragile society. And many things that we think are already beyond us, like discrimination and racism, are basically still with us and in a big way. Um, and uh, the fact that we think that they are buried already deep in the ground is wrong. They are buried under a little, tiny, thin shell that is easily breakable. Fragile, frail, thin, and a little bit of a crisis. And it's known that crises in the world are the, the ultimate reason why all bitterness... Uh, uh, feelings against different ethnic groups are coming up. It was the economic crisis in, in Europe that brought the Nazism and Hitler to power, and it's always the case. And uh, let's go and see what happened in the United States. Uh, let's go to the next one. And uh, let's say, uh, well, I'm missing one. Let's go to the next one. Um, I missed one. Okay, so let's go to the previous one. Sorry for that. Uh, so I missed one. And the missed one was, and I'm, maybe I took it because the, the picture is hard to see. It was uh, the policeman in Minnesota that with his knee is sitting on the neck of uh, George Floyd, a black person that demonstrated. And basically, despite the fact that he saw that he suffocated to death, that he's crying for his mother for help, murdered him brutally by suffocating him. This raised the huge uh, uh, the, uh, protest in the United States under one 
wonderful term that calls black lives matter. You know, you cannot, you know, black people are not animals. Their lives does matter. But we thought, okay, this is only an issue of uh, the, the United States. This is not with us. And then the scientific community started to go into it and, and say that, well, we are not clean from that. Even us, the people that are supposed to be the most objective one, we are there. And again, let's go to science, to nature, to cell. Science has a racism problem. You know, sci black scientists are not represented. Women are not represented in the scientific community. We are discriminating them, annoyingly so. Another one in nature on the right side. White senior academics still resist recognizing racism. So it's with us. The, the communities, it is supposed to be the most objective, the most neutral one. Let's go to the next one. And... Uh, and uh, that's that's it, I think. And uh, let me just finish. Uh, this is the last slide to say that science is my co-pilot. We should really do not let politics, racism, discrimination, any consideration penetrate the world of truth. We shall remain loyal as physicians to our patients and as scientists to the scientific truth. We shall say it, declare it, clear and loud, because this is the only way out of the pandemic and mostly in order to have all of us around the idea that this is the only way to solve the world's problem. So thank you very much for listening, wherever you are, and hopefully the pandemic will be soon beyond, beyond us and we shall all be able to meet soon physically in Singapore or in Lindau in Germany, where other Nobel laureates are meeting uh, um, annually. And I wish you uh, great luck uh, and uh, great success in your career and wherever the road is going to take you. Thank you very much from Israel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chehanova. That was really a very provocative and also a very telling presentation. You've had, there are lots of questions and they are very uh, thoughtful questions. I'll just read a few out so that you can answer them. Now, I just uh, for picking it up, you know, uh, there were questions about trust and I've grouped them together. And it's a question of how can you we heal the distrust and uh, the sort of uh, aversion to against the scientific community that has increased between scientists and yeah scientists. it's a very complicated one i'll try to be very short in order to leave time for other questions and um, i think that scientists it's our role to do it uh, maybe along with the media and the communication i think that the media you know i talked about the social uh, networks that this served that made a disservice uh, to the community I think that scientists should get out of their ivory tower and talk to the public. But in order to talk to the public, they need the media. I cannot talk to the public uh, just by standing in the city square and, and, and talk to the public. I need the media to become more serious. And instead of uh, reporting every day on robbery, on raping, on, on sexiest uh, subjects in the eyes of the public, they should become more serious, you know, the television, the newspaper, they, they should see their role not as selling themselves, but as educating the public. And for that, they need the, it should be a really tight collaboration between the scientific community, people who are eloquent, you know, some of the scientists cannot explain it, but many can, they know what they do. And, and, and the media that should undertake a different role. It's not enough to close down Facebook of uh, President Trump at the minute that America is set on fire. We should do it much earlier when this movement starts, when there is a threat to our construction, to our building, not when the building is already half destroyed. So this is part of it. It's our role to do it, but we need other forces to join in. Thank you. Now, the, uh, the next question is slightly different. 
the world has advanced. And in fact, we've had earlier pandemics. How will the world handle this situation? And if the next pandemic happens, if it's worse, how will we handle it? Well, good things happened and bad things happened. Let's start with the bad things. The bad things is that uh, countries were caught completely not ready. Only countries that have uh, uh, island countries that could isolate themselves, like South Korea, like Singapore, like uh, Hong Kong, like um, Cyprus. Um, and Israel is also in an island. We are not formally a geographic island, but unfortunately we are surrounded by not uh, countries that they are not uh, have not fell in love with us. And uh, therefore we are kind of an island. So uh, these countries managed it okay. Some better, some less say better, but but managed it okay. Some countries uh, that have many entries and exits and don't have a solid public health system, like America. Think about America. America turned out to be completely disintegrated. President Trump uh, destroyed even the, the little that Barack Obama tried uh, uh, to build in the health system. Uh, it's 50 different, 51 different states that each has its own policy. Uh, getting, uh, you know, even now when there is a vaccination, they cannot vaccinate the population. It's going so slowly that it's unbelievable. Um, you need the, so this is the bad things that happen. People came, you know, the health system was caught unready in certain countries. Spain, Germany, Germany, wow, the giant Germany was caught in, in, in a way unready to go. But the good thing that happens is transparency and collaboration between the, in the scientific community. China should get, a, you know, a, you know, a, a star. They immediately publish the sequence of the virus that served the pharma company in order to, to, to designate, to, to design the vaccine. True, you know, we could have isolated it from patients that traveled all over the world. But nevertheless, they went and do it quite early. There are other complaints. To China, but let's forget about it. But China was very open about this, uh, uh, about this information, allowed the whole world uh, to go. It. Then the companies went very quickly into it. You know, it's unprecedented in the history of the pharma industry that we are able to generate a vaccine or any drug in nine months. It's really including the clinical trial through urgent uh, permission, but a permission. I got vaccinated. I got already the two shots. The second one I got two days ago. The first one I got almost a month ago. Unbelievable. Unprecedented. So we should learn from the lessons. Countries should change health systems, go more to the public. At the end, we realize that the private sector cannot do much. Whenever it has to do with sustaining a country, the government has to undertake. When we are talking about education, like in Singapore, when we are talking about health, it's the government role to do it. And government should walk in and take the major needs of the population under their control. Right. Thank you, uh, Professor. Now, before, I know that they're going to signal me to stop. But before that, let me just ask you this question there. There's been a lot of talk about the politicization of science during this pandemic. And that's really retarded the fast progress. But you have also alluded to the multilateral cooperation that has occurred that brought the vaccine out so quickly. So between the politicization of science and the negativity that has gone on and cooperation, where do you come out? Has the scientific community come out well on this? I am not sure so. I am not sure so. The scientific community should, in Israel, you know, Israel is a good example because I know exactly what's going on here. Decisions in Israel were based a lot based on on elections, on the political instability. So, for example, lockdown. In Israel, I can be directly critical of the government. The lockdown in Israel should have been should have been differential. You know, some communities were in a head infection rate that is much taller, much higher than other communities. But nevertheless, the government punished the whole country by collective punishment. Why? Because the prime minister is going to an election and he needs support from communities that if locking them down selectively, he would have lost their support. I think that the scientific community, of course, the scientific community cannot intervene with the politician. 
but the scientific community should have really stood on the back legs, on the tip of the fingers, and saying, this is our truth. We are not sacrificing. You politicians can do whatever you need. We are loyal to the truth. And unfortunately, in Israel too, the scientific and the medical community surrendered to the politicians' needs. Not completely, but disappointingly. Thank you. Now, one last question, and very quickly. Um, Andrew, Andrew Wakefield. How should we deal with the Andrew Wakefields? You know, the, per, uh, the questioner, Kaibo, who sent in the question said, personally, we should stop him talking to the public. On the other hand, this will be against the freedom, freedom of speech. Do you think it is possible to develop some mechanism to censor this kind of speech? Again, it's all by, you know, of course, I'm completely for free uh, 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 speech, for the freedom of speech. Though, you know, it's, it's a subject to be discussed. You know, once it's coming to a damage to the society, we should think about it. I'm not preaching now to limit it because once you start to limit it, the slope becomes very slippery. You can go down and down and down. But the reaction should come immediately. When he published it, when he first said it, a panel of 10 physicians should come to the same very media that he is using, whether it's the Lancet or the television, and tell with a loud voice, this is nonsense. And use history. Use the eradication of polio. Use the eradication of other plagues, of smallpox, and so on and so forth, and tell them, Whatever makes you healthy is the vaccination. The vaccination is one of the biggest stories. Think about pertussis. Think about cholera. Think about all what we did in this century. Think about Edward Jenner. We should use history and we should use the scientific community and the communication channels in order to immediately, on time, at the same very second, refute all this nonsense. Any retardation, any postponement, any weak response just strengthen the other side. Thank you. Now, I've been told that it is time to end the session. In fact, we've run over a little. So thank you very much, Professor uh, Chehanova. On behalf of the audience, uh, 400 over members who have been participants who have been watching this program. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very interesting discussion. All the best. See you, soon. See you soon physically. I much prefer the physical audience than the virtual one sitting in front of my computer seeing nobody. Yeah. Well, next year. Next this year, time. hopefully. Yes, let's go for it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your participation and your interest in this program. See you again. And by the way, there's an interesting program following. So, Tomorrow, there'll be more things being put out. Bye. Bye-bye.